Well, oh, I need to do one more thing. Well, here we are in our little podcast studio. Rolling. Oops, I got an earpiece in. It's because I work for the CIA. I need to get with it, John. Okay, Tara. Does that make this the John and Tara podcast? It is. I've got little hairs out of place. <laughs> yeah, they're doing what they want to do. Mm-hmm. They're John hairs, that's for sure. John and Tara podcast. <laughs> Good morning. No coffee this morning. I've got tea. Yeah. You've got your water and shake. Yep. Three, three protein shake. Yeah, yours is the, the dynamic trio. Yeah. I can see you here. All right. Well, I have a topic. Um, oh, I know no. you're not surprised. Are you ready to roll? Yeah. Okay. So you've recently um, had an amazing healing journey. Oh, geez. And you've healed pretty amazingly from a very significant condition. And you've held off on sharing during the process. But I think mm-hmm. now is a good time to share, John. It's kind of a setup. Yeah. Well, it can really help others. And so that's why I think it's time to share as well. Okay. <clears throat> well, I had a diverticular uh, inflammation of the kind that explodes in your abdomen. <laughs> so <laughs> is that the good way to explain it? Um, I had a uh, injury. I got hit in my intestine impaled myself on my mountain bike handlebars. I was heading down a hill. There was a root sticking out. It hooked my front tire, jackknifed my bars. I went over the bar and I, for some odd reason, fed it right into my lower abdomen. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And uh, really hurt, really knocked the wind out of me. You were behind me quite a ways. Um, I kind of laid on the ground for a little bit. And then got up and told you I crashed and you were like, oh, are you okay? And I was like, yep. <laughs> <laughs> Just fine. I'm okay. And so then I. This is about how long ago? Well, it was a couple of years back, maybe four and a half, five years. So it took a while for the issue to develop. So the doctors originally thought it, it just totally looked like from the outside because you haven't had a colonoscopy. So they haven't, they can't actually determine fully um, from what I understand. Mm-hmm. They're just going by what they typically see. And so to them, it looks like diverticulitis. Well, I had CT scan, I had x-ray, you know, that kind of thing. So yeah, I didn't get my, my rear end scoped. Yeah. <laughs> So, so diverticulitis uh, are, from what I understand, it, it, forgive me if this is the wrong terminology, but I, they're like lesions in the, the colon. And uh, so people commonly, it's, it's quite common as people get older. And well, the diverticuli like, are the little pockets, right? The little, oh, the lobes inside of the, you're right, inside of the intestines. And so um, they, are exacerbated by skins like fruit skins and seeds. And so that's how people usually find out they have diverticulitis is they have an attack uh, much more mild than yours. Typically, you know, people's pain tolerance is a lot lower. And so they'll go like my abdomen really hurts. And um, usually they'll get antibiotics because there's an infection in one of those. Inflammation. Well, there's inflammation. Infection and inflammation. But then usually it's not until the infection happens too that they'll go on antibiotics and then the infection goes down because the the pockets are infected Mm -hmm. well you had a pocket apparently that just kept getting it ballooned up outside of my intestine so if it was on the outside of my intestine it was like a growth Mm -hmm. and it ballooned up and got to about the size of a baseball and then uh it popped and so i had a bunch of infectious material in my in my abdomen and I got pretty sick. Um, we were up at a, a vacation spot and, with your grandma and I had to lay in bed for two days before we left. And I was in probably the most amount of pain. I've broken my ankle. I've uh, hyperextended my thoracic, uh, smacked my head between my shoulder blades uh, in, a, in a motocross accident. Um, <clears throat> and 
I think that was the incident in my abdomen was probably the most painful thing I've ever gone through. And um, yeah, there was lots of cold sweats, lots of pain. My body was dealing with infection. It was dealing with infection that got released. Um, we found out once, two weeks later, once I got to the hospital, um, I was in so much pain, I wasn't going to let anybody touch me. Um, the shirt that I was wearing or blankets I would cover myself with was hurting my my skin was so sensitive. My nerves were like on fire and just covering myself with a blanket would hurt. Um, I was sweating every night. <laughs> I would sleep with towels <clears throat> so then I could just toss them on the floor once they were used. And uh, yeah, and I spent two weeks uh, thinking that I had, you know, something wrong, but we didn't know what. We thought maybe it was a serious bout of constipation. We thought, you know, um, I didn't eat for two weeks because I was, I knew it was in my gut and I was so afraid of it, um, the pain that I didn't eat. Uh, I drank water uh, towards the end of two weeks. I started drinking some broth and stuff like that. You'd make me broth vegetable and uh, animal broth and uh, so chicken and bison and yeah it was a <clears throat> it was a tormentous time uh, those first two weeks and then the second week in I started going back to work and doing some things I couldn't do a lot I was kind of stiff my abdomen was stiff I couldn't really move very well um, and then we, I started making deliveries again for my company, going different places. And when I would come home, sometimes it would take me 15, 20 minutes to get out of the car <laughs> because I was in such pain and I was weak. I was very weak. I was much skinnier than I am now. I look like I was uh, going to be modeling on a runway in Paris. <laughs> well, you're getting pretty gaunt too, or like your coloring was, mm. you normally have nice nice robust color like i do now yeah and yeah, i lost 42 pounds and um and uh so i didn't know that it took you nearly 20 minutes to get out of the vehicle but i could tell that you know it was taking a lot of energy out of you coming up the stairs obviously you weren't <clears throat> your usual right. and so what convinced you to finally go to the doctor you <laughs> <laughs> well i know that's kind of a loaded question but like it's it's also a bigger question uh, i probably wouldn't have gone um i probably would have just rested more and uh and then slowly came back um i was taking lots of lots of herbs lots of uh different types of remedies and uh, there was a, there was things that were helping, um, and so when we went into the doctor, they said, "Well, you have an abscess." So the story of going to the doctor, you came to me on a Friday, I think it was two weeks after. And yeah, you, I was like, "Well, in my mind, I'm like before the weekend hits." <laughs> <laughs> uh, unfortunately, I came to you early in the morning because, uh, and I suggested we go to urgent care because it was a long day. <laughs> well, but also in, in hindsight, uh, urgent care fills up pretty, you know, it's a good get there right away in the morning because um, it did end up being a very long day. So keep going. So you came to me and said, um, I'm going to take you into the hospital. We're going to go to urgent care. And I said, OK. And I had no fight in me. I was all of it was taken out of me. I had no no will to resist, which normally I'm quite resistant on on many many things and i just said okay and you were pretty surprised you thought it was going to be an argument taking me in i didn't think it was going to be an argument but i thought there would at least be some like oh, you know just give me the weekend or something like that but you're like okay and i'm like <clears throat> all right i'm gonna shower quick and it must <laughs> let's be pretty going. bad he just said okay yeah yeah um I think it was the right timing to go into the doctor um, and the doctor, the, the specialist actually said, you know, what we went to the hospital in our town and then they told us they were going to ambulance me up to a hospital with more capabilities. 
And I said, no, we'll drive. And cause we don't have insurance. And so, um, I wasn't going to pay for an ambulance ride that I didn't need because we drove into the hospital and I walked into the hospital. So there's no reason I needed an ambulance, but they were really worried at first. They thought my appendix had burst. They thought it might be my spleen. They thought a different bunch of different things, you know, but they knew something had ruptured. And when they finally did the CT scan, they saw an abscess. They still didn't know what it was. Um, they didn't know that it was from my intestine. Um, and when we went up to uh, the hospital in Minneapolis, we um, uh, they started x-raying. And first they gave me intravenous antibiotics, which, which helped uh, quite a bit. That was in, <clears throat> in our town here where they they started the intravenous antibiotics and that helped immensely that's also why the, the doctor's like technically i can't okay this mm -hmm. you know or i guess he technically could but he's like i can't recommend it mm -hmm. but your your all your symptoms and stuff were improving within a couple hours pretty dramatically after mm -hmm. i mean they were very powerful antibiotics mm -hmm. so yeah thankful they do the antibiotics definitely have their time and place yeah to be used for sure you know i would have if they had asked me like hey uh do you want antibiotics you know i would have probably said no um <laughs> if they said we're going to give you antibiotics and i was like okay <laughs> <laughs> so <clears throat> yeah it's you didn't give me an option it's an interesting thing because you didn't give me an option either you weren't going to force me to go to the hospital but you didn't say you know, I think we should talk about you going to the hospital because I would have said no. Yeah, um, I just said, I think it's time to go in. Yeah, and I agreed. So the power of suggestion when <laughs> when a person is really weak or un, unable to do anything. Um, so we got up to the hospital in Minneapolis and they did the CT. They said, you have an abscess. We're going to go in and extract some fluid and we're going to put in a drain tube because that's how you get that kind of stuff out. So they put in this little tiny thin drain tube well i don't think they had that plan going in when when we got there they were still observing you they were they were in other surgeries and stuff and i don't know if it was part of the plan because they were observing your um, ct scan so i don't know if it was a part of the their plan or divine plan because mm. they didn't do that until that oh, and i'm even starting to forget it was the next morning because mm -hmm. they took you in before I, even I could get there um, because of our their opening hours, and I think that you being you you being on antibiotics further for a greater amount of time and them doing it the next morning. Like I said, I don't know if it was their plan. Well, ultimately it was the divine plan, but I think that actually helped. I think by the time they got in, it was at a manageable stage where they didn't have to do an urgent surgery where they could actually just take a really big needle or a big needle with a big <laughs> plunger <laughs> uh, container and essentially extract a lot of pus. And it, it we, in call, hindsight, we like to call it infection, Tara. In, <laughs> it was infection. <laughs> also known as infection. <laughs> pus sounds so gross. <laughs> it does sound really gross. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and um, so uh, that was that day, and well, that was the beginning of that day. You had texted me, they're taking me in, and that was, I mean, there's so much when you get to that level of care also that's, I mean, yeah, you, I could have said no. Control. Yeah, I could have said no, it's not out of your control. Well, it, it I had survived for two weeks, it, there was no massive emergency they were it was just scheduling thing and they thought they should get me in sooner than later of course you know we went through the whole conversation and and i was keeping you up to date and they said you know we're going to put a little drain tube in and 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 i was like all right <clears throat> um i knew that i had a problem in my abdomen but you know it was it was only when they showed me the ct scans that it was like oh that's what that is you know because i felt kind of bloated you know you a big pimple inside of you <laughs> no it, it was an abscess Tara. It was an abscess, but why do you use all these gross terms <laughs> you're so gross <laughs> i know you just hate it <laughs> well we'll watch the pimple doctor later and you can no. decide if you want to say that again no i'm going to tape you. your eyelids open so you have to watch it no. <laughs> and so it so then i realized Modern torturing 
yeah. <laughs> devices. Then I will we'll watch we'll watch that and we'll, we'll have two screens and on this one we'll have the pimple doctor and on this one we'll have a, a ocean scene with lots of different exotic fish. Oh yeah, exotic is not so bad. It's the deep ocean fish. We'll that, have that deep is, ocean fish, the ugly ones, <laughs> the ones that have to stay at the bottom. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> All right, that was a little sidetrack. But... <laughs> <clears throat> well, um, <clears throat> I went in. They gave me a little bit of, and when I say a little bit, I mean, they gave me a little bit of fentanyl. Mm -hmm. It was like 0 0.0032 or something like that. Evidently fentanyl is really strong. And that was in a mixture of, of stuff that went in my IV. And uh, yeah, they could have put in 10 tubes. I, I was like, doctor's like, Do you, uh, does that hurt? I'm like, nope. He's like, does this hurt? I'm like, nope. I'm like, <laughs> do what you got to do. <laughs> So, uh, and in hindsight too, because we had to go back several times for, to get the the drain tube checked and, and and that kind of thing, the original doctor that put that in and did that was a really great doctor because mm -hmm. um, you get to know a few of them over time, and I, I think you were really blessed to have that one be your main first, doctor, main yeah. doctor, and the one who who did the original procedure. Yep, he was a brilliant doctor. Um, you can tell you really cared, you know, he wasn't just doing a job. Well, yeah. And he, he, I think he was kind of, I think he would be, he would have been the guy that was more interested in what happened. You know, how did this happen? Why, why is this like this? You know, mm -hmm. kind of that, that doctor that does investigation kind of work while he does his work. It's not just like, oh yeah, you got this, I'm going to give you this and then you can go home. You know, it's kind of like, you know, probing around, asking you questions, looking at stuff, trying to match things up really well. It's like he, his work really interests him mm -hmm. and a reason why people get sick or a reason why people can get healthier. You know, like he said, during the process, he told me that my body was really strong. And I said, well, you see lots of people that are very sick. And he goes, well, 20% of my patients are like you. They're athletic. They come in, they're not, something happened, you know, as, you know, maybe some trauma from before, like me, maybe some something they didn't know, they couldn't correlate what happened and why it did. And, but they heal fast, because it was just a, a happenstance kind of thing. Um, but looking back, you know, taking care of your health. So let's say this happened over four and a half years, which is what we think happened. Um, and you have to share how that came to you too. Oh, well, while the time I was sick for about the first four weeks to six weeks, um, I was I was on the couch for almost four and a half months, right? Roughly. Yeah. Um, not able to lift. You know, I had the the tube in for six months, but I started going back to work like the last month and a half and doing things because I felt really good. Mm -hmm. um, but I had still had the tube in, and it was in my lower abdomen, and I had a little little connector and I had a little bag I just kept in my pocket for drainage. And uh, I'll tell more about that in a little bit. But um, uh, I was cooking breakfast and I was, I was always wondering in my mind, I was always wondering why this happened, what, how to prevent it in the future, that kind of stuff, because nobody knew. And um, they were telling me it was diverticulitis gone awry, you know, it was out of control. And I'm, I didn't buy it because I'd never had any gut problems. I'd never had any, any intestinal problems. I never had stomach problems. I, my whole life, nobody in my family does. Um, so they were like, Oh, somebody back in your family's history has it. I'm like, yeah, no, no. Um, and so anyway, I'm sitting there cooking breakfast and just thinking about putting whatever, flipping the eggs, doing whatever I was doing. And all of a sudden I had a vision, like a flash, like I had just taken some DMT, you know, and I don't do that, but my, your brain makes DMT. So maybe that was it. I don't know. It just felt like a flash. Right. And I, I was very aware and I had the feelings and I felt the pain and my body had told me, here's what happened. You're, you're, you had this accident and you, and I felt the pain of the accident in my gut, not the pain of the the after effects. And it was it was a very overwhelming just a vision like uh, is a memory, it was an embedded memory in my body, but it came to me like a vision. Mm -hmm. And I knew instantaneously, this is this is why this happened. And I, 
and I kind of hollered out of the kitchen to you and you came in and I said, I know what happened. And I told you the instance and I was like, this, this was crazy. It was just like all of a sudden. And, um, yeah. So then I told my doctor and he goes, well, I don't know. I don't know. You know, and, you know, it's hard, it's hard for them until they see it a couple of times, you know, right. If somebody else has a, a, an impalement in their gut and then they have the same problem. Right. But since that accident, I can, in my memory and I can track my, my performance had been going down and I was like, well, I'm 50, 50 years old. I'm 53 now. So I was 48 or 49 then. And I'm like, I'm 53. You know, of course my, my performance, I'm getting older. Right. And, um, it's like, no, you don't, it doesn't happen that quickly. You know, I've never had a, such a drastic change in my performance, my energy, had, my stamina. Similar to when you had a hernia? Because that happens yeah. too. Yeah, yeah, it was. Yep. Because that's what made me get <clears throat> checked for a hernia. And I had two little micro hernias on my belt line. Um, so they weren't, they were barely detectable, but they were, they were starting to, my stamina was going down. My strength was going down. It, you really your abdomen, your core, your gut, everything, you know, it's, it's a, it's a symbiosis with your entire system. And if you have injury, if you have decline in somewhere, you're going to feel it. And I, I no longer will I attribute anything to age because now I know, you know, I'm back to normal and I know how it feels. I'm recovering still, but I feel better than I did before the bursting, you know? So, um, I'm, I'm not as strong because I spent basically six months getting weak, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, atrophying and, but now I'm working out again and that type of stuff. So I'm feeling stronger all the time. And, and, uh, yeah, well, that's kind of the story up to that point. Um, when I was on a plethora of herbs, a plethora of nutritional products. Um, I went off sugar for, for sure, for four, four months, five months for real, you know, like not 100% for the last, for the fifth month. I mean, I was having some coffee with a little cane sugar in it, that kind of stuff. But, um, you know, I started having dessert again about what, three, four weeks ago you know, and, and that kind of thing and, and realize it doesn't uh, do for me <laughs> what I would think it would do for me or what I think I need. So, um, back on not having a lot of sugar again. Um, what were you feeling? Well, it was just a desire, you know, you, you know what you like, you know, what you had in the past, you, you know, you think, Oh, I should have some of this or I should have chocolate cake. Yes. Let's have some chocolate cake, white cake. Let's have some, you know, mm -hmm. Uh, key lime pie, uh, you know, a caramel, you know, stuff like that. And it's like, eh, I don't need that kind of stuff. You know, it's, it's just a party for my tongue. Right. And my body doesn't like it as much as it used to. So I don't know why that is. Do you think all that time away from it you, is the news of difference, right? You, mm -hmm. you can, I can really more. feel the difference. Yeah, mm -hmm. for sure. So, uh, we got up to the point where we were talking about taking the tube out and I, I had a hole in my intestine this entire time and, and the hole was closing. It was getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And um, you actually, you had a fistula and I'm going to be a little bit detailed because uh, I, the real intention of this podcast overall too, is to help people. And, you know, we talk about health, marriage, business, life, and you found out through this process too, how many people do have diverticulitis mm -hmm. and just, you know, don't talk about it or maybe it's it, yeah for some reason yeah it just kind yeah of came as soon, out soon as I started talking about it with people they would bring up oh my brother my uncle my cousin my mom my dad me me my wife my you know they're just going down the list and I'm like holy crap you yeah. know lots of people have this problem and and um so I I found uh peptides towards well I'm, I'm gonna back up just oh, so go one, ahead. one more step there's I mean, this could be several podcasts in itself, but we'll find out from questions and comments to which direction you like to go. But you actually, so you, the, the diverticula 
had actually burst and your body had then sequestered all the infection yes into its own pouch pouch <clears throat> and created a fistula so a fistula is a, a, a essentially a connection from one organ to another or one part of the body to the other fortunately yours went to the outside of your abdomen um there are people who have <coughs> fistula attached to their like you have their bladder their stomach their and so you can literally then have a connection from one organ to another that's not natural it's just the body's attempt to have an an outlet a drain and yeah that was one thing that the doctors asked you know is your um do you have irritation in your bladder? Is there, is there any blood in your bladder? Is there any gas in your bladder? Is there any? Yeah. So you were very fortunate in that way. Um, and that was actually one of the indicators, you know, when you were, when I said, okay, how about we go in and just get this checked out? Because <laughs> my thing was, okay, chills and fever, you know, that's the way the body copes. But if you start having pain in your kidneys, because you're kind of urination issues and i said if there's any pain that starts going up your back and into your kidneys you have to let me know yeah and that morning i did ask you specifically yeah i do send some of that it was so painful everywhere is really hard to isolate any one thing that could have been an issue right but in hindsight my indicator would be that you were having intermittent chills and sweats and stuff so your body was really fighting off an internal infection um, mm. that needed assistance mm. yeah. but you're good at hiding it i call you my cat you are a leo <laughs> and so i know now in the future also to be extra aware yeah well i i did like a cat i just ran away and hid mm -hmm. i i laid in bed for two days i didn't get out of bed for two whole days um yeah which is super, not me, super odd, but yeah, I did what an animal would do that's sick. You know, I just go find a place, to, go find a cave to hide in and get better. So what did you do to heal this, John? Because you, <coughs> you were um, very decided to not have the surgery because there's a, who mm. knows what kind of complications from surgery. <clears throat> yeah, well, the surgeries if you need the surgery it could do wonders for you um it's a resection of the intestine they take out the bad portion and then reconnect the good portions um if it goes well if you don't have too big of an area that's infected or oh yeah you could lose your whole intestine your whole large intestine and then have a colostomy bag for the rest of your life mm -hmm. and so yeah i was i was going to keep the drain tube as long as i needed to um to not have to have the major surgery and when you go in, you got to be careful because when you're when you're in the hospital, they do this every day. They do these surgeries all the time. And and we met the surgeon that does these surgeries and, you know, he does what four or five a day, you know, just <laughs> just stack them or you know, rack them up and, and knock them down. You know, it's just like uh, but he was another great one, too, where he's like, uh, you know, as long as you want to keep it in and wait, he's like, I'd rather right. not have to have the surgery. Also, he says you're better in better shape than most patients that are coming in, you know, there are some people that they actually deny the surgery because they're already in such poor health. They don't know if that resecting is mm -hmm. actually going to take. So that's another yeah. incentive to really take care of your health. Don't smoke, don't get overweight. Well, you um, say don't smoke, but the reason is if you smoke, they won't do the surgery because your vasculature shrinks when you smoke. And so there won't be enough blood flow, he said, to heal it. So that's uh, that's a drawback to smoking, just in case anybody's looking for a reason, Another one. <laughs> a reason to quit. <laughs> yeah, because it could be a, a surgery that you really need and want, you know, might not be as much of an option in in, in some cases. And uh, yeah, that would be a real bummer. Well, and then later in life, you know, anytime you get something cut, you get scar tissue, right? Mm -hmm. So later in life, that that resection could have a hard ring that doesn't stretch. So if you if you have a, a lot moving through your bowels and this won't stretch, it, it forms a tight point. Mm -hmm. And so you always have to be careful. And if it's too tight, you can tear it. So he was explaining all this stuff to us. And, and I was just like, I'd rather not, you know, I'd rather 
And yeah. he was very supportive of that. Yeah, I had this tiny little tube. And as I got better and better, I actually functioned really well with the tube. Um, it was really small. It was against my skin. I could tape it down, um, you know, not to get too graphic, but we, you know, we were still being husband and wife, you know, we were still having a bedroom fun. <laughs> <laughs> and, and uh, still everything was working in my life. And it just happened to have this tube that was ultimately I would I noticed what was coming out looked more like regular bodily fluid like whatever's in between your organs because your organs they slide on each other you know everything is is it's slimy inside of there right and your body provides the the lubrication for that because um you don't even notice it you know you notice when you have a full stomach but you just put a whole bunch of food in your stomach and it's pushing all the other organs around you know and everything's got to move and and so they're very slippery you know, when surgeons do heart, heart, uh, I'm, I'm in the medical device field in manufacturing. And so when surgeons do heart surgeries, they literally wear gloves that have spikes on them. So when they grab the heart, they can, they can hold it because it's too slippery. It'll just fly out of your hands. Right. And nobody wants to be chasing a heart down the hallway. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, anyone who's dressed an animal or, or cook, in cooking yeah, too. You, right. Yeah. Everything is slippery. Mm -hmm. So, um, so the, the gloves would be akin to like a cat's tongue. Yeah, yeah. And then it causes trauma to the heart. And I've actually worked on a product that is different, it, a little vacuum stand that holds the heart in it. And uh, then they don't have to puncture the heart with little tiny spikes. Yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, I was functioning well, but it got to the point where I saw what I thought was normal fluid. And he I asked my doctor in a couple of visits, he goes, Yeah, that's what it looks like, you know, and but they would they would push some dye in and they would get some transfer from the from the tube into my intestine and two, two visits before my last visit, he couldn't, he would push some in and they would suck it out. And he couldn't get anything out and he's like i just watched it we'd watch it on the x-ray transfer into my into my uh my intestine but he couldn't get it to come out so that meant there was a barrier and that we assume is the mucous membrane which is permeable but was not allowing it to come back out and so he thought that was really interesting i don't think they've ever had anybody go as long as me and been such a study yeah. on how things work um, because they were really questioning and talking and all this different type of stuff. And, um, and I was participating heavily. So I would, I would say I did this, I did that. I was lifting the other day and I felt I kind of injured myself. I felt the tube touching the hole and he pulled that back and we did a whole bunch of different things. I was very active with it. Um, and then finally, my, my last visit, I said, I should have took the tube out two weeks ago. And because I really felt it irritating the hole. And I said, if this thing is touching the hole and it keeps touching the hole, the hole is never going to heal. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and he's like, you're right. He goes, um, we could take the tube out now. And I said, I don't know that I'm 100% ready to take it out because we talked about how much contamination my body can handle, right? Like how much, how much infectious material waste essentially coming out of my intestine in my body can my body handle and he said well your body's really strong you handled the initial you know baseball size explosion um that type of thing <clears throat> and so we decided we'd start pulling it out like a half an inch every three or four days and he did the first one and then i was going to do consecutive ones at home and then there was a point where we cut the tube, which releases a suture, which lets a curl go because they had a French curl in it. Um, and that's how it kind of locks into your body and stays there. Um, so anyway, I'm a very technical guy, I'm very mechanical. I work in the medical field. I, <clears throat> I literally found the company that makes the tube that I had in my body and I looked at it online and I, I learned about it. Um, and so I started pulling it out. And when I snipped that tube, it was a great relief because it let the curl go. Mm. And then it wasn't even another week. And I had on a Sunday, I should know the date, but it was about, what, maybe six weeks ago now, maybe. Mm -hmm. um, I pulled it out all the way. And 
I should go back to that second to the last visit. I was already taking peptides. Um, I had found peptides and there's a specific peptide called BPC-157 and it's for your gut and it's for other injuries. It helps everywhere in your body. They call it the, it's body protection compound 157. They call it the miracle peptide. And I said to my doctor and he didn't know what it was. He didn't know what peptides were. Um, and I'm like, well, pep insulin is a peptide. And so it's like, oh, you know, peptide is just a, a chain of amino acids that your body makes. So there'll be a certain number five or 10 or 16 or 20 or eight or whatever it is. Your body puts them together because your body knows what needs to be cared for, healed, rebuilt, whatever it is. And your body puts that stuff together. <clears throat> That's why branch chain aminos are so good for you. And obviously check your sources and do your own reading, but um, there are, th you know, we eat food because it gives us energy. And so supplements are concentrated food stuff source, you know, whatever. Well, proteins also are, are made up of amino acids. <clears throat> right. So that's why it feels so good when you have a good steak. You know, if you haven't had red meat for a couple of weeks, you know, and then you have a steak, you know, and it just feels so good. You know, your body just goes, oh, yeah. Well, I think someone could do a study on this if they haven't already. But I think this is good proof as to why fasting and good digestion are so important. Because your body actually makes BPP, BPC-157 in, mm -hmm. the, in the stomach, mm -hmm. which is why it's one of the few peptides that you can take orally because it will survive the digestive tract. And since the body already makes it, I think that's why, you know, there's there's wisdom in, in certain traditions, we'll say, not just religious, but let's just say mm. there are a lot of religious traditions that uh, institute fasting. Fasting is important. And I think there's a lot of wisdom in that. And, you know, your body needs that time to take a break. Um, and then those there, your body can not only take a break, but then produce those peptides. I think it just, I don't know, to me, it makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. Someone do the research because that will be fascinating. I'm sure it'll prove out, yeah. but also why you need to protect your digestive system and why the Chinese um, and traditional Chinese medicine are so adamant about preserving the fire in, and also in Ayurvedic medicine. And that is not emphasized so much in our culture because you need to that the fire is a is symbolic not just it's not totally literal i mean it's 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 symbolic in a lot of ways well, we make our own heat right right um but and you got to uh, be able to burn off things so your body needs to be able to break down proteins to yeah. make to down into those amino acids that you need as well and if mm. your digestion is weak you know things you can't just start do it right? falling apart so yeah. all right thanks for that Allowing that segment. Well, that's a segue with Tara, <laughs> <laughs> the the peptide segue. Um, so yeah, the peptides I started taking, I ordered uh, uh, from GorillaHealing.com. I ordered the Wolverine spray for the mouth with the BPC-157 and the TB-500, which is a HGH stimulator. Uh, Human growth hormone, which apparently the, the, the two together are just much more strong should we say yeah much more effective especially if you're healing you know bpc 157 for general use um with the tb 500 if you have an injury you're healing or what i had um yes that then you need human growth hormone to pop up also right and and that helps rapid healing that's why they call it wolverine spray because you heal so much faster so I don't know if they named it a Wolverine after a Marvel Wolverine, or if they named it Wolverine after the Wolverine in the wild that's so resilient and and can take down a moose and eat the whole thing. Um, <laughs> so chicken or the egg kind of thing. Right. Yeah. So um, so what I've been doing is I, for the last what sixty days now, maybe a little more than sixty days, yeah, sixty ish, mm -hmm. seventy days. Um, I've been spraying it in my mouth. I've been nasally sn sniffing, snorting it up my nose nasally with a with a with a nasal spray atomizer, and I've been injecting it. And you want to inject it as close to the point of injury as possible. 
uh, mine is right down by my right below my belly button. So I just inject to either side of my belly button. I have injected into the the subcutaneous fat on my on my butt too on the side on the rear. Um, That's why that one's so much sexier. <laughs> <laughs> my right cheek is yeah. sexier. You're saying. <laughs> Now I know which side to pose for when I'm trying to be sexy. Right. <laughs> so, um, and the injection is done with just a little, uh, uh, they call them insulin syringes. Uh, they're very tiny. You can hardly feel them go in. You feel like just a little boop like that. It's just, I've never injected myself and I do it like twice a day now. <laughs> so it was, it's worth it. Um, yeah, I feel, you had to like look up all this stuff and then just try it out. Oh man. Uh, trying to figure out the difference between the milliliters and the micrograms and the, you know, how much of the, the bacteria static water to reconstitute the peptides with and, and all that kind of stuff is, is just, um, it, it took a lot. There, there isn't any one site that gives you all the answers. Um, you can figure it out. You can find somebody like me that knows how to do it for, and, and everything was in kilograms. It's not, none of it was for pounds. So I had to convert from micrograms to milliliters to kilogram dosage to, yeah. <laughs> it was crazy. I'm like, good grief. And I, I deal in, in that world of, 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 uh, yeah, but yours is a different <clears throat> measurement. You're I deal in the lengths. world of conversion. Yeah. Be, yeah. Between many things. If so. someone had said to convert these inches to centimeters or millimeters, you would have find it's more natural. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I have the formulas, you know, surface finishes now, you know, there's different surface finish call outs and there's different hardness call outs for material that are, they, so many strange things nowadays. It used to be very standardized. And, uh, so anyway, uh, getting back to this, uh, so I inject, I spray it in my nose and I take it in my mouth. And then after 60 days, I went on a so almost 70 days. I went off it for a week. They say go on 30 off for two weeks. I went for total healing. Um, and that was my call. It was, um, I'm doing a lot more micrograms than they say you can do every day. Um, and that was my call. That's just me. You got to feel your body. You got to heal thyself, right? You got to sense. It's not just, oh, I'm going to take all of this. It's going to heal me. You got to feel what's going on. And I think that's incredibly important that that you are sensing what's going on with yourself. Do you wish you had started this from the beginning, the peptides right away? You know, I, I think it probably would have been it pro I can't say that it would have been better, but I could think that it might have been better. It might have been f a faster process, but I was um, interesting that you were basically fasting for perhaps weeks, essentially. <clears throat> so your body hypothetically would have been making more of it or more readily available. I pretty much did the forty day fast. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was I was off of. Uh, I was not on a liquid diet. We should think back if it was a very long time before I was on solid stuff. And when I started solid stuff, it was some vegetables and vegetable broth and then eggs. Um, well, a lot of blended soups. Maybe you don't remember mm, so much. Yeah. I remember we got back from yeah. the hospital and one of their criteria for leaving was that you have to be able to eat normal food. I mean, mm. it literally said, oh, you know, yeah. back to a normal diet. And it's like, Okay. And since, you know, you hadn't had diverticulitis or those similar type of conditions, we weren't already accustomed to no seeds, no skins. Right. And, and so it was like, okay, back to normal. So we got home. I'm like, well, I'm going to make John a great soup. And I made wild chicken, wild rice soup, which was really yummy, but is like super fibrous. You know, because yeah. that's like the, the mandate of all good, healthy food is you need good fiber mm. as well. And oh my gosh, do I feel bad that I didn't understand that to begin with. And yeah, so quickly that was like, learned. that was two days of pain. Yeah, yeah. and I quickly learned, I'm like, okay, w this is what we're going to do. So um, <laughs> diet um, was a really big step, it's a big change as well. So what I personally did, because you were really out of it. Um, you you actually did initiate juicing um, to get <clears throat> raw, good juice. 
and I'll let you talk about that in a minute. Mm -hmm. uh, but I instituted cooking for us uh, as much like blended type of foods as possible and warm. Fortunately, in a way, this was during the winter months at this point. So I think it was even good that you weren't tempted to like go outside and do stuff. I mean, you, you were really, you know, kept mm -hmm. in. But so I did lots of blended type soups. I especially initially omitted uh, um, what is it um, insoluble fiber so the kind of fiber that is is really rough um, so like a soluble fiber would be a, a softer like think of like asparagus or uh, we don't eat this but uh, okra stuff that's like smoother slimier uh, also like sweet potatoes squashes did more stuff like that not these insoluble fiber like the wild rice uh, greens I didn't do especially in the beginning um, unless it was well cooked if it was well cooked and blended then I would make stuff with with greens and so that's just kind of some general guidelines but I, your body obviously you still needs fiber but insoluble fiber is a lot gentler and moves out a lot smoother and so that's something that I did for quite a while until you felt that you could do more or like eggs, that sort of thing. You didn't do red meat for quite a while, probably a good at least four months. And that was that was different. Mm -hmm. That's not customary for you. And yeah, so and then you did a lot of juicing almost mm -hmm. like every morning. Every morning for months and months and months. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was basically on a juice fast. Um, I would mix in other things. But yeah, you're right. Um, I think when we left the hospital, we, they were like, well, are you eating? You know, I don't see I wasn't eating the hospital food, you were bringing me food. Yeah. And I wasn't eating much. Yeah. Uh, and then they said, are you eating? I was like, Oh, yeah, I'm eating everything. <laughs> and they're like, Oh, okay, good. We'll mark that down, you know. Yeah. And, and that's when I knew you were feeling better because you're back to your self <laughs> you were resistant about something i don't even remember get why. me out of here yeah, <laughs> yeah after a couple of days in the hospital i was done you know i was just I, I i remember saying i'm just laying here anyway i might as well be laying at home you know this is costing money here so you know just go home and lay around but uh yeah and then i could do some work you know on the computer <laughs> So uh, BPC-157 earlier in the, in the stage, potentially, maybe not. Um, you know, everybody I listen to says, you know, well, if you get injured, start taking it right away. But if you get injured, you know, you're healthy, right? You, I wasn't healthy, right? you know, when, when I first, when we went to, into the hospital, I wasn't healthy at all. And um, I think, you know, maybe three weeks earlier or something like that, you know, it probably would have helped things heal faster. I don't, I don't know. It did make a big difference when I started taking it and I found it that must, must have been the right time, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, we believe in divine intervention and everything happens for a reason. And I like how it keeps focusing on your painting back there. The face <laughs> the keeps face. popping up. <laughs> it's distracting. Um, <clears throat> so I think that it happened at the right time. Would I advise somebody? What what I would do is I'd tell somebody, start taking it, see how you feel, right? I mean, you got you got to feel what's going on with you, right? I wonder though if you had taken it earlier, like when your body was still creating the fistula and stuff, if it would have actually helped. In if it would have helped, this air quotes here, if it would have facilitated, let's say, the body making that structure rather than the intestine. Because when you started, the, the body, your body was already healing the hole. Mm -hmm. And there, we don't know, well, we kind of, we already, there's a point where you, we could see evidence that the hole was closing. And so in hindsight, I think that's a good point, you know, because the body is already going like, oh, this is what we need to do. We need to close this hole, not make all this other tissue yeah. for this other reason. Because yeah. the body's intelligent, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, your body knows there's a wound that's not supposed to be there. And yeah. so, yeah. Oh, I think it happened at the right time. I can't really tell anybody else what to do. Um, your doctor can't tell you what to do because he didn't even, my doctor didn't even know what peptides were. So, yeah. um, 
you know, peptides are, have been around for a while, but they're kind of coming out as cutting edge science now because more and more people are using them. Um, they are a substance that is banned in, in, in uh, performance competition uh, because why would you want to heal faster? Uh, <laughs> I don't think they can detect it though. Um, yeah, they probably can't. <clears throat> um, so. Cause your body makes them. Yeah. And we don't technically need to do a BPC podcast because <laughs> there's tons of them out there, but yeah, um, <clears throat> this is, but you don't hear as many about personal experiences, particularly in this realm. You'll hear about, oh, I had a knee injury. It healed my meniscus. It healed my shoulder, right. um, which are fabulous in and of, you know, testimonials as well. Mm -hmm. um, but this one's pretty extraordinary. Your doctor actually had said he had worked with at least what was it one person that was was going to gradually try to remove the tube, but he had never seen it actually work. Hmm. And so your testimony. Yeah, now I've been what? What did we say? Maybe, Four to six weeks. Maybe I think. eight weeks. I would have to look at it, but I've been <laughs> I've been without it for quite a while now. Yeah. And um, I think yeah, it is close to eight weeks. I've been doing yeah. very good. Haven't had any physical problems, no signs of infection, no, you know, I've had some pains from healing, I believe, you know, I've healed from lots of things and I, there is pain in healing. It's kind of like when you get a cut and then two weeks later, if you touch that spot, it's still sore, right? Mm -hmm. And even if it's healed, there's a scar, you can touch it and it'll still be sore. Um, Cause the nerves are got cut and they're healing and, and they put in a tube and that, that got cut. Right. Um, so I could feel, the healing, um, <clears throat> my intestine is sensitive, right? Even though I didn't have diverticulitis per se, my intestine is sensitive. So I am cautious, you know? How so, how do you sense that? Well, if I, if I touch my, I can feel on my skin, but I can feel more internal. Um, like if I am eating, if I eat a lot and I maybe I'm slightly dehydrated, I can feel it. I'm very sensitive to that now. Um, and so, yeah. So what else in hindsight, what, what have you changed or what hmm. is more apparent? And, you know, and, and what do you do? I mean, my, the, my loss of stamina and, and strength and I noticed it during a couple of winters, right? I was sweating funny in the winter. Like when I was outside working, I would get chilled. And that had never happened to me in my entire life. That should have been a big indicator that there was something wrong. We had talked about it. We thought maybe my lymph was clogged, you know, something like that. Um, I think it was. Yeah, right? Yeah. There's many different things that could happen, but, you know, it's like, well, what do you do then? Do you do a lymph drain? Well, I did a lymph drain. Okay, that's clear now. And uh, there's, I had an abscess in my abdomen, you know, and would would the doctor have found it if I went in for a regular checkup? I don't go in for a regular checkup. So, but no, because I didn't have pain. You know, I didn't have, I didn't have any other than just gradually slowing down. You know, I didn't have a like, oh, my gut hurts. You know, I didn't have that. It wasn't obvious. <clears throat> yeah, I could drink two bottles of wine and eat four burgers and, you know, I could... I could do everything and, and I could still perform. I could still go out and lift and I could still go out and mountain bike and, and, you know, set, set, I've set a record at a track out here. So, I mean that you don't think there's anything wrong with you when you're performing. Right. So it's kind of like, how do you figure it out? At this point, if you were able to go back a year or two, mm -hmm. would you, coach yourself and doing things differently or paying attention to certain things? You know, so much happened for me and that's a whole nother six podcast series. Um, so much happened for me personally during the time I was down. Um, we changed a lot of things we're doing in business. Um, I started two new companies. I'm changing my focus in business my focus in life is different my my feeling of the quality of what i want to have in my life is different you know the quality between us the quality in friendships the the 
the things that really matter in life, you know, I mean, you can go buy a big house, you can have fast cars, you can have, you know, if you're a younger guy and you're single, you can have 10 girlfriends, whatever you want, but you know, so if you're an older guy and single, you can't. <laughs> well, it would it kind of wears you out. And you're, you're a little bit smarter, you know, you know that it, it matters more to have a, a good quality relationship than 10. I just thought that was funny. It would be worth pointing out. 10 relationships that have no depth and no quality, you know. I mean, you know, the, the, the guys that, okay, I'll talk shit for a second. <laughs> The guys that are doing that are the guys that are taking testosterone and testosterone is not the way to go. Testosterone makes you aggressive. Testosterone makes you horny. Testosterone makes your body produce all the fluids it produced when you're young. And the guys are like, ah, I got to get rid of it somewhere, you know? And it's like, <laughs> you know, it, it's just not the way to go. You know, I, I honestly would not want to be a perpetual 18 year old. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I was, 19 maybe no, no 21 dude at, least. at at dude i'm gonna call you bro <laughs> <laughs> you know it, it's it, testosterone is why guys call women bro <laughs> yeah. um no i i certainly would not want to be perpetually my younger self because they they sound young they sound uh you know they they have a this odd mixture of wisdom and uh, stupidity, young, dumb, and full of some stuff, you know, they, you're they, saying the, the older guys are taking testosterone yes, sound like the yes. wisdom combined with, um, uh, yeah, with a bunch of, you know, fluids in their body. <laughs> they, it, it, they, they, they just don't, it just doesn't jive with me. So, mm -hmm. um, so I think, I think there are other ways, there are natural ways there are, and, and then just taking care of yourself, you know, I mean, Again, I chalked it up to age why my body was slowing down, but it wasn't that. Um, could I advise myself differently? I don't think I would if I could, because I think what happened needed to happen. And it there's so much change in our world right now. I needed to become a different person too. I needed to, to look at things differently because I was more like, I was a little more like, well, that's stupid. You're dumb. That's ridiculous. Don't just don't do it, you know, and, and all this kind of stuff. And I, I really came out of this with a little bit of, of a, a little bit more understanding and compassion and, and, you know, feeling for people that are having problems, you know, because it just happened to me. It was just like, oh my gosh, this just happened. I don't know. You so know? what kind of problems did you find yourself being more compassionate about? Well, let me just continue. I don't want a question like that. Let's just continue down this path. I mean, I have no compassion for your question, Tara. Evidently, we're going to get around to it at some point. Okay, all right. Yeah. Well, that's a little bit more regression from you is fine. Or assertiveness, whatever you want to call it. No, I, I, I would not change what I did because I can't. You know, that's one thing. I don't have regrets about my past. You know, I, I don't have regrets because it has brought me to where I am. It has made me who I am. If I had advised myself and then found it and then, you know, what would that do to my ego? Oh, yeah, I know what's going on in my body. I know what's wrong with me every time. I know, you know, it's it now I'm an arrogant prick. You know, it's like instead of holy crap, this just happened to me. I literally started praying more, you know, I literally, I almost died, you know, and the doctors, I was an anomaly when I got in the hospital, the doctors came in and they were looking at me. It's like, you got to see the guy and, you know, and, and compared to this back then I looked dead, right. I, I looked like I was dying and I lost all the collagen in my face. My lips got thin, you know, I lost and lost my 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 nice neck here. <laughs> I lost the weight that I have back on my gut. You know, I lost everything, and but that kept me alive, right? That extra weight I had on that I had survived off of that fat that I had. You know, it wasn't fat fat, but I I could have been trimmer. You know, and and I can't imagine if let's say I was a bodybuilder, you know, well, my body would have ate muscle, right? And my body ate muscle and fat because I wasn't a bodybuilder that was, you know, 2% body fat. Um, so I see things very differently. You know, I, I feel different. Um, the quality of my conversations with people is different. You know, I'm not, I, I'm not as selfish as I was. And 
multiple ways, you know, not to get into details, but just to be like, you know, I decided that what I'm going to do into my future is I'm going to give to the world and that hence the companies that I started, hence the price points that I'm changing on products that I have that I, you know, that I can license and that type of thing. And so I'm, I'm more like going to, I'm more like, uh, a rainmaker to be a rainmaker instead of a taker, right? Instead of a, how much can I get for myself, you know? And, um, you know, it, it's because uh, I could have died. And I've had accidents before where I probably should have died, um, but I came out of them virtually unscathed. Um, and I think it's, I think I've had enough of those. I've had enough near misses i've had enough saves you know my guardian angels have worked overtime they got calluses on their hands and blisters on their feet and you know their their wings are missing some feathers and, <laughs> you know it's like they've chased me around for a long time and and you know i'm i'm very grateful you know to be married to you i'm very grateful to have the family i have you know with you and and other people in my family i'm very grateful for uh my knowledge, my capabilities, my understandings, and I'm always wanting to be better and I need to continue to do that, you know, and, and become, you know, and, and, uh, so, yeah. <laughs> so I have a kind of philosophical question and this is by no means to try to pin you down, although you love that. But it is it is a, a great scenario to be able to ask a question. So I think what's really amazing about this podcast is that even for us, it changes our conversation in the sense that this is the same topics, but thinking about how other people might receive this or how it can help in particular, uh, at least for me, it gets me to think about things differently. Mm -hmm. And I think we can talk about things differently and and think about it in a terms of other people, not necessarily taking it personally for us. Mm -hmm. So that's a big preface to say, this is not a personal, like yeah. pinning you down or digging on you. But do you think that- You're making me nervous. You say it one more time, I'm gonna be like, I'm leaving. That's it, this, this interview is over. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> uh, so you're talking about this whole event you know, really culminating into a real life changing time, not just a single event, but is a period of time that was very life changing. And one might say, well, John, you know, if when you had that accident on the mountain bike trail, if you had gone in and gotten a CT scan then, and they could say, yeah, it looks like you've injured your colon. It's okay at this point, just keep an eye on it, you know, or, uh, you know, John, um, maybe two burgers and two bottles of wine is more than enough, you know, and so do we perpetuate upon our, ourselves the lessons we need to learn because we're not doing the things along the way. And again, this is not a personal thing. No, it's, I get it. I yeah. get it. Yeah, totally. What are your thoughts on that? Yes. <laughs> it's my thought. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, if you don't learn lessons, the if you if you don't learn from lessons the lessons will continue you know it's i think that the the process of learning as a human being is a metaphysical process and i think because we're not just human we're spiritual we're human spiritual beings and i think that that, that the learning is metaphysical and because that's the only place that it really matters. You know, it matters how we're interacting with other human beings. It matters what we're doing or not doing. It matters how we're treating ourselves and what we're preparing ourselves for. Um, you know, leveling up is, is a big deal. You know, cutting out the things that waste your time or cause you to be less than what you are. Um, <clears throat> it's, a, it's a taxing road to, to do that. You know, anybody that's done any sports you know, they're trying to cut fractions of a second off their movement time. They're trying to cut fractions of an inch off of their particular angle that they're moving in. You know, they're they're trying to gain uh, uh, extra eighth of a pound of muscle in their legs so they can have cut their 
their explosion time down, you know, they're, and you know, the, the, that's why it's so tempting to do performance enhancing drugs, right? Because you take this thing and it's like, everything gets turboed up mm -hmm. and, um, so you can turbo yourself up metaphysically. You can turbo yourself up um, by doing little things along the way. You know, little changes make make big deviations in process and in behaviors and in in action. And so, so yes, I think you know it was there was obviously a lesson I wasn't learning other ways through meditation, through study of different spiritual methods, texts, that type of stuff, ancient texts, that, that type of thing. Um, processes of training your, your psychic ability, your awareness of your environment, that type of thing. You know, there was obviously things that I needed to learn that I wasn't learning. So I had this happen to me. Um, it was very odd that I had that mountain bike crash that way. Um, you know, that I, I've had, uh, I had another mountain bike crash that was a, a realization um, where I was literally felt myself get slammed to the ground backwards and, and tore some muscle off of my glute, my hip, and uh, was on the couch for 30, 45 days back in the back in, in the past. And I saw that as a spiritual event also. And so I wasn't learning something and I needed to learn and, and and yet you're very excited to get out mountain biking again. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I'm not you excited I'm not, to learn some more lessons. No, I'm not looking for an injury. I'm looking to ex express yeah. myself and, and get away, you know, think, you know, you get on the mountain bike track and you're not really thinking about things, but you come out with realizations, you come out with understandings. You could like, Oh, Oh, or you come out just refreshed with energy to go back into your work or, or deal with an issue you're dealing with or whatever it is, you know, we all need a break, we all need time away and, and people have different things. Some people walk on the beach, some people do gymnastics, some people mountain bike, some people race cars, you know, whatever it is, we need to have the things that we can do that some people do martial arts, you know, some people meditate. Um, you know, there's lots of ways, you know, I, I really like being in the woods, you know, just riding the trails, you know, or rail in the trails, whatever I'm doing, you know, it's, I like going fast, you know, I've had motorcycles and that type of thing. I don't have motorcycles now, but I, <laughs> I like to go fast and, and, uh, you know, there's, it's a different type of thing. You know, if you're on a mountain bike going fast, it's, it's like a motorcycle going fast. You know, it's your, your trees are going by at 30 miles an hour on a motorcycle or on a, on a mountain bike and on the motorcycle, you know, everything could be going by you at a, at 130 miles an hour, you know, and, and or you could be going by them at that speed it, it's it's all relative right <laughs> it depends it depends on how you want to look at things mm -hmm. right um no officer i was not going that fast they were going they were know, going for the bat fast in the other direction they were they were going 80 miles an hour in the opposite direction <laughs> <laughs> 70 miles an hour in the yeah. opposite direction yeah it's so you know realizations you know that type of stuff we can have a podcast about that we've been going for an hour now um the BPC 157, I'm still taking. Um, I think it's going to be something that I, I take probably for the rest of my life. I, I do view it as a, as a very good um, nutritional supplement. Mm -hmm. you know. Have you felt it improve other areas of your body? Yeah, everything. I think um, my strength, my stamina. Um, I have more... Uh, capability than I can perform at right now. Like I'm still recovering. I noticed I'm still recovering because, you know, well, they did this study where they took college athletes. They had like 30 college athletes. They put them in bed for 30 days. They had to stay in the bed for 30 days. They couldn't walk, right? They could sit up and do some things, but they wanted to be as mobile, immobile as possible. After 30 days, they took them back in the gym. Before that, they had tested what their strength was their strength was greatly reduced. It took them six months to nine months, depending on 
who they were to get back to the same strength before the 30 days in the bed. Well, I did walk because I had to go to the bathroom. I had to get up and go to the bathroom and stuff over the course of the five and a half to six months that I was down, um, four and a half months, totally down. Um, but I feel like I've made a quite a recovery, you know, given the fact that I'm a 53 year old man, I'm not a 22 year old college athlete, right? Um, but I am not capable of doing stuff for like four hours straight. You know, I, if I'm out working in the yard and I'm, and I'm in the shop and I'm doing things, you know, I've got to watch what I'm doing. I've got to make sure I keep up on my water. I got to keep my nutrition up. You know, I'm not 18 years, years old anymore, you know, where I'm just go, go, go all day. And then I'm fine. And I barely sleep, you know, and I'm fine the next day. Um, I'm getting back to the point where I'll be able to do that, but I could see it's probably going to take me a good five or six months, you know, to be relatively normal back to a hundred percent. So, but the BPC and the, and the TV 500 are really helping and the nutritional supplements and the, you know, yeah, I think all the stuff you did prior to, and um, those of you listening, if you have any questions, do put them in the comments and we can share what John did. Mm. Obviously, it may be different, a different protocol for you, but there are a lot of supplements, herbs, mm. and so forth. So this is obviously a quick summary. Of, yeah, you can find us on uh, Instagram and and uh, Twitter. You can find me, Facebook. just John Bachlin, Instagram and Twitter. Yeah, Facebook also. Yep. J-O-N-B-A-K-L-U-N-D. -J and also T A R A, B A K L U N D. Yep. yep. But John shares more, and you'll get a lot more. Tara won't respond to you. She's too busy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it depends. Yeah. <laughs> You're more uh, social media centric, but yeah, I I do a lot of the behind the, the scenes stuff. Yeah. So I think that's good enough for now. That that was kind of yeah. jumped me with that one, but. I don't know. You like it. You, you... <laughs> I like being jumped. I do. Yeah. I like it when you jump me. Yep. Yeah. If I if I told you last night jump, what the topic jump. topic is, you'd be like, ah, uh, I don't know. I don't want to do that. Uh... Yeah. Yeah. That's right. If you yeah. give me an option, it's always no. Ah. Nah. Nah. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. On that note, like and subscribe. Share with your friends. Adios. Have a good one.